Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can use the amazing feature of output caching that we got in ASP.NET Core in .NET 7 and how you can actually use the built-in support we just got in .NET 8 for Redis to allow for distributed caching of the output. This is something that we could technically do before, however, not everybody understands Redis really, really well and because there was no provider provided by Microsoft on how to do the type of caching, Nobody really did it with the output cache, but now in .NET 8, Microsoft themselves provide that type of Redis provider, and in this video I'm going to show you how you can use it and why they built it in such an amazing way. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, and for more training, check out my courses on domtrain.com. Now before I move on, I'd like to let you know that we just launched a brand new course on domtrain called Getting Started with Solution Architecture, and that course is made by James Eastham. Like I have said in the past, I only want to make courses myself on topics I am an absolute expert on and on this I just am not as good as James so I asked him to come over and author that course for us. James is a senior solution architect for AWS so his knowledge on the subject and his position in the biggest cloud provider in the world makes him the perfect educator for something like this. The course is fantastic, I've taken it myself and I cannot stress enough how good the quality of that course is. I have said it in the past and I will say it again, getting very good in solution architecture and understanding the subject will really elevate you as a software engineer more than becoming better at the code itself because after some point you're gonna plateau but solution architecture doesn't really have a limit and the moment you understand when to choose the right tool for the right job you're going to be way more valuable into your company and your team. Now to celebrate the launch I want to offer the first 400 of you a 15% discount code so you can use the code you see now on your screen and claim a 15% discount at checkout. Trust me this go really really fast so if you want to get the course get it sooner than later. Now back to the video. All right let me show you what I have here. I have a simple .NET 8 API over here and it's a weather API but it's not your basic weather API the one you get from the template. I've actually wired up Open Weather Map, which is a service you can use to actually pull the real current weather. So now instead of creating five fake weathers, I can run this API and I can go to postman to call it. And if I say give me the weather for London, as you're going to see, we get 16 as a temperature, which is Celsius, and then feels like 16.53. So we have a way to get the current weather. However, the problem is that this service, every time I call this endpoint, will actually go and call the API service over here. Now, what you can say at this point is, hey Nick, just add sort of a cache on this service level over here and be done with it. And even though technically that is true, that is not the most efficient level to actually add that type of caching. The most efficient level for this specific use case is actually on the output itself. Whatever that response is at that point, we can cache all that, the JSON serialized text, everything, and just put it somewhere and return it. And up until .NET 7, we could actually do that with output caching, which is a new thing in .NET 7, very, very easily. To do that, all you need to do is go to the services and say builder.services.add output cache. We won't really configure everything. We're just going to add this, which adds the services behind the scenes. And then after the redirection, I'm going to say app.use output cache. And once I have that, I have two options. I can either do that with the minimal API approach or the attribute approach. What I can do with the minimal API approach is say dot after the request processing here and say cache output. And since I haven't specified any defaults here, then it's a bit unclear what exactly will be cached and for how long. But what I can do is I can use the options over here and I can say, for example, cache it or don't cache it. By default, if you do say cache output, caching will happen. And then we can say uh, expire in time span. And I can say, for example, here, time span dot. Uh, realistically, you can say something like from minutes and say five minutes because how often does the weather change within a five minute gap it doesn't really change and you can change that to 10 if it's more relevant for you i think five is a good medium here so within all of those five minutes no matter how many requests hit that endpoint only the first one will actually do any sort of processing and to prove that i'm gonna go here and i'm just gonna say debug and as you're going to see the moment i hit that endpoint we're going to get a request in here so the breakpoint is hit 
we're getting the weather and that weather now magically is cached but it's the output but at that stage it's only in memory just this single process but of course this can be problematic because if i scale out this application meaning i'm running many instances of this application to scale it and redirect the traffic then each instance will actually cache in memory its own output and you could have inconsistent weathers but just to prove that actually at this point it is cached i'm gonna go ahead and re hit that endpoint and as you can see no breakpoint is really being hit i'm just returning from the cache that breakpoint is not touched. Super efficient, super easy, but if you do want to scale out that application, you have a distributed system, well, you can't really do that. There are ways to build your own cache provider. So instead of having the built-in one, the in-memory one, you can use one that has Redis. And I've actually done this in the past, but it is very tricky to implement. And you don't have to anymore because Microsoft actually made their own. And the coolest thing about this is that it seems like this is written by Mark Gravel, who used to be one of the people working on the Redis SDK we have that is from Stack Exchange before Stack Exchange got acquired and he moved to Microsoft. So it's from someone who has an insanely well understanding on the subject. Let's see how we can incorporate it into this application. I'm going to go to NuGet over here and I'm going to search for Microsoft.extensions.caching and then Stack Exchange redis not service exchange redis stack exchange redis and i'm going to use the latest rc version over here so let's go ahead and install that i mean rc1 of dotnet 8 at this point so now with that in place all i need to do to incorporate it is say add stack exchange output cache and i can of course configure it as well so you have configuration options here for example a configuration string configuration options an instance name and you can even provide your own multiplexer so you might have seen People provide multiplexers here, so you would have like an async and then connection and then connect async. You would await it. And I'm going to run Redis locally. So the endpoint will be localhost and then 6379, which is the default port. I can do something like this, or I could very much not do any of this and say, for example, instance name and give this instance the weather API as the name and then configuration and pass that as a string so I can say localhost and then the endpoint. So both of these options will actually work depends on how much control you need, especially around the multiplex refactory. So once we have that, then we don't really need to do anything. I'm going to go ahead and just stick a breakpoint here and I'm going to run Redis. Now I have Docker installed, so I'm going to run Redis in Docker and I'm going to go here in the console and use the official Redis stack server and default ports, default everything. I'm just going to say that, pull the image. Redis is now running. And if I want to explore Redis and just see what's in there, I'm using another Redis desktop manager, which if I refresh, you can see all the Redis options over here. Currently, we have nothing, no databases because, well, no keys are there. So let's go ahead and run this API now and see what happens. So currently nothing in the cache. And if I go ahead and I say, give me the weather for London, then as you're going to see, we're going to hit that endpoint. We're going to get the weather for London. But then if I try to call it again, nothing happens. No endpoint is being hit. And that's because the response now is cached in a distributed way into Redis. So if I go here and I say, refresh this, now you can see the weather API, which is the prefix of the instance name we provided. Then you can see another prefix over here. And then you have the exact request that is being called. So in this case, it is localhost 5001 weather and then city London. So that query string parameter is also part of the key, which means that if I go ahead and I say, give me the weather for London, I'm going to keep getting that cached value, which is cached for, in my case, five minutes. But if I say, hey, how about you give me the uh, weather for Milan, Italy, then if you do that, then we will hit the endpoint. That's because the query string parameter is part of the key. And now those keys are separately cached in a very nice way. So if you want to see that cached weather or that cached weather, they're separated. Very, very nice. Now, this is not the only cool thing about this, because one of the hardest thing about cache is actually cache invalidation. So the way um, this type of caching does it is by allowing you to provide tags. And that was actually one of the most complicated things to do if you were to write your own Redis provider. But now all you want to do is go here and chain this as a tag. And I'm going to tag this as a weather cache, for example. So whenever I say add this into the cache, also give it a name and say that this is weather related, basically. And now to invalidate it, you wouldn't really have a separate endpoint for invalidation. It would be part of your uh, process. But just to show you how it would work, I'm going to create an inval uh, endpoint and I'm going to say async here 
and pass down the I output cache store over here. So I'm going to say store and I'm going to say return results dot OK over here. But I'm also going to say await store dot evict by tag. And what I want to evict here is a by tag weather. And this also needs me to provide a cancellation token because of course it does. But to actually show you how the invalidation will work, I need to add these entries in a way they're tagged. So I have to go ahead and just delete them first. So let's go ahead and clear the cache, this one and this one, and re-add them. So I'm going to call Milan. We're going to hit that endpoint. And then I'm going to do London as well. We're going to hit that endpoint. We're going to cache it. And now if I go to Redis and I refresh, you're going to see two more entries. You're going to see this one over here, which sort of helps with the tags and this one over here, which keep tracks of entries related to that tag. So the tag here is a weather. This is a Z set for Redis, if you know what that is, where it's basically a set. And then you have the individual entries to know what to invalidate. So now what I can do is I can go to Postman and I can say invalidate anything weather related. And the moment I do that, as you're going to see, my cache is now cleared. I still have this entry because it's just long term entry, but all the other ones do get removed. So if I go and I say, give me the weather for London again, I'm going to get it. How cool is that? And how easy is it? And everything else still works. So if you want to have things like multiple tags, expiry policies, you want to vary by value, you want to vary by a header, host, query, anything, all that still works. In any case, output caching is an amazing feature. It's wildly different than the response caching we used to have. And by the way, if you want to use something like this in, uh, for example, controllers, then you can use the output cache attribute, which works both here in minimal APIs, but also controllers. Highly recommended feature. Caching can really just fix a lot of performance problems you might have in your application. And with Redis, it is just very, very easy to deal with. But now I want from you. Are you using output caching or are you using something else? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.